The first computer was the analytical engine invented by Charles Babbage in 1833. Or the Z3 invented by Konrad Zuse in 1941 if you insist that it actually works. Or Colossus invented in Bletchley Park in 1944 if you insist that it is electronic. Or ENIAC built at a US Army research lab in 1945 if you insist that it is American. The subsequent miniaturization of a central processing unit onto a single chip and its continuous evolution opened up new horizons and allowed the exploration of hitherto unknown worlds. After some decades of steep performance increases of the CPU through improvements in architectural and manufacturing technology, the GPU was invented to parallelize computation, initially for graphics acceleration, but soon also used for general purpose parallel computation. Basically, in a GPU, you have some simpler processing elements than a CPU, but replicated on the space of a chip. Can we go a step beyond this and use an even simpler processing element, and in order to get absolutely massive parallelism, replicated not in space, but replicated sideways in time? If you're wondering what's meant by sideways in time, I'll gladly give you a 60 second abstract, but for more details, may I refer you to previous videos? The key idea is that there are multiple time dimensions. Here are three in red. This gives rise to timelines shown here in black. The thick black arrows are timelines, the thin arrows show the direction of sideways in time. Many physicists say that progress in fundamental physics has been stuck and some new ideas are needed. This channel endeavors to supply some. So, if you're an academic professional and your mouse is hovering over the thumbs down button, by all means be critical of them, but please don't reject the concepts presented here out of hand because they differ from current interpretations of physics. This is the point. The differences of this approach to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics are examined in the first video of this channel. Also the terms timeline and mind states are defined there. In short, Timeline is the subjective path through the time dimensions of an observer and is generally diagonal to the time dimensions. Mind state is nothing esoteric, just the processing state of an observer's brain, analogous to the contents of all the memories and registers in the computer at a particular moment. In each timeline, there are copies of observers. The world is deterministic, so the observers can run in perfect synchronization with each other, and when they do, we say that they share the same mind state. When differing information reaches the observer copies, then their mind states diverge and never reconverge. The key concept to understand is that we look at superposition not as a property of particles, which are always in well-defined states, but in effect a property of observer mind states. We'd like to put this into practice and employ sideways in time computation. We want to solve a problem that requires a lot of trial and error say with an input space of n bits and a function that doesn't have a good heuristic, so there's nothing better than trying out all the 2 to the n possibilities. Later in this video we'll discuss two problems that are like that, prime factorization and neural network training. On a normal CPU you need to try out all the 2 to the n possibilities one after the other. The input is represented by the circles on the left. The processing element tries this input and flags a pass in green or a fail in red. Finally, this output is signaled to the observer. This needs to sequentially try out all the 2 to the n input combinations until it finds a pass. For large n, this is practically impossible. If you have a GPU that is a thousand times faster, it only reduces to 2 to the n minus 10. The first thing we need is a mechanism that jumbles up the input bits sideways in time without telling the observers. Then each of the enormous number of possible inputs is handled in parallel by one of the copies of the PE processing element. One of them flags the correct result. Can the PE calculation part be done on a normal computer chip? The problem is path selection or decoherence as it is normally known. When information leaks into the environment, it limits the states that the observer's minds can diverge to. Processing has to be done by photons, which are suitably ephemeral, or with single atoms cooled close to absolute zero. The first problem arises when we want to look at the result. As soon as the observer copies look, the mind states of all the 2 to the n observers diverge and one of them sees the correct result and all the other 2 to the n minus 1 see a failure. This is no good. This looks to each observer as if we just tried one of the combinations at random with a 1 out of 2 to the n chance of success. So after randomization and calculation we need a third phase. Some diffusion process to spread the correct result sideways in time using interference with neighboring spaces. So in the end at least many if not all of the observers see the correct result. This kind of machine already exists and is called a quantum computer. However, it is not usually portrayed as functioning sideways in time. 
There is parallel computation going on, but in traditional physics none of the potential spaces are considered real. To understand this in the context of multiple time dimensions, we need to relearn some quantum computing concepts. This is how accepted physics looks at them. Qubit, which in quantum computing is the unit of computation. Superposition. The qubits can be in indeterminate states, both 0 and 1 at the same time. Entanglement. Two qubits can be entangled, so even though both are in superposition, their states correlate. Measurement. When you measure a qubit, it stops being in superposition and becomes a definite random value. Qubits that are entangled with it then also become the corresponding definite value. Decoherence. When information about the qubits leaks out into the environment, they stop being in superposition. This usually is unwanted in quantum computing, but qubits in superpositions are fragile. Interference. Qubits can interfere with their own superpositions, which quantum algorithms exploit in order to increase the likelihood of returning the correct result. This is something that quantum computing cannot guarantee. Phase. This is a mysterious property that qubits have, which is not directly observable. Let's start with a very simple model of computation sideways in time. In one time dimension, we have a point now, g generations from the origin. With two time dimensions, this is a line and we have one sideways in time dimension. With three time dimensions, which is what we're considering here, we have two sideways in time directions, and the spaces G, which are G generations from the origin, form a plane. We will represent this by a square of four spaces. These are supposed to be replicated. For more resolution, we need more squares, but it gets complicated. So let's start with this two by two square of spaces that are neighbors sideways in time. Here, each square contains a bit, which we'll show just like this, black for 1, white for 0. This allows us to fill in the first entry of our translation table. A qubit is just a bit. Now we define some operations on these bits. H operation. The H operation flips the bottom two bits in neighboring spaces like this without telling the observer copies living in these spaces which ones. So the observer copies in these spaces will all continue sharing the same mind state. When they look at the state of the bit, then their mind states diverge. Half of them see the bit is on and half is off. As I mentioned in the previous video, this is simultaneously the most and least random thing imaginable. From the outside, there's no randomness at all. For each observer copy, it is absolutely impossible to predict an outcome. When the observers repeat this experiment, the impression is that the bits are random with a 50% probability of being on or off. Interestingly, the pattern produced by the H operation is different when we start from an all one state although to the observers it also appears to be a 50% probability and random. The effect is noticeable when we apply two H operations in a row. The bits return to their original state. If the observers are unaware of extra time dimensions, they will conclude that there must be extra information attached to each bit or qubit, so it can return to its previous state from a completely random 50% superposition of on and off. In our model here, there is no extra information in the bit, it is encoded in the state of the neighboring spaces sideways in time. Bell state. We can use that to build a so-called bell state. Here we have two bits initialized to zero. We put one through an H operation, and then we conditionally invert the other depending on the state of the first. As you see, in all these spaces, the bits are always the same. You never get the zero one or one zero combinations. When the observer copies check the state of one of the bits, their mind states split, which therefore seems to determine the state of the other bit. So there's no such thing as entanglement or superposition of states. Any superposition is in the mind states of the observers. We can move the bits very far apart. No information passes between them. The divergence happens in the mind state of the observer copies, and the speed of this divergence is independent of the distance of the bits. To simplify the diagrams, let's stop showing the observers explicitly. Basic gate operations. Here we'll define three basic operations on our spaces, sx, sy, and sz. Here they are. sx inverts the right-hand two bits and then flips the square over the vertical axis. sy does a similar thing, inverting the bottom bits and flipping across the other axis. sz rotates the four bits around. We start with sx. Here is a four-element cycle. sy looks like this and sz like this. We can arrange four states like this and show Sx as the square red connection. Now Sy produces a similar square, we use green to show the Sy operations. In 3D we can put these on the same diagram like this. The states we show as cubes, 
For visibility from all sides, we just repeat the pattern on each face. We'll arrange all the little state cubes so that they're exactly opposite the inverses as shown here. Using globe terminology, at the poles you have the all zero and all one states. The latitude corresponds to the number of bits in the white zero state. The x, y, z axes are shown in red, green and blue respectively. We'll add the sz operation in blue. You see it has no effect on the two states at the poles, but the blue ring at the equator connects the four states. The sx, sy and sz operations correspond to 90 degree rotations on our 3D diagram. To do a 180 degree rotation, we can define an x operation that does two sx in a row. As far as the two states at the poles are concerned, an x operation behaves like an invert. Let's include the states with one and three dots and add two more blue rings. Now we have five latitude layers with zero, one, two, three and four dots. We've missed two states. I'm showing them vertically opposite each other, but bear in mind that they belong to the equatorial layer since they also have two bits on and two bits off. So this looks like a discrete and simplified version of the Bloch sphere used in quantum computing. At this stage, we can fill in our table a bit more. Superposition is a shared mind state. Entanglement does not actually exist. This is just an illusion. Measurement is the mind state divergence. Decoherence is path selection. Interference is just that, but with neighboring states sideways in time. Phase. This is the hardest concept in this table to capture. There are a couple of differences between this model and how quantum computing is considered to work. The first one relates to the phase. Instead of a 2x2 grid, let's now look at a bigger one. In all these grids, there are 50% black and 50% white bits. So to the observers that measure them, these bits represent an even probability of being 0 or 1. But this and this are also grids with half the bits on and off. These are not so easily modeled with a few numbers. Translated into quantum computing terms, one of the axioms of quantum computing is that the probability amplitude, which is a pair of complex numbers, can completely describe a qubit. This is what I'm questioning. I think this works well with two qubits and is a reasonable approximation for a few qubits, but falls apart for bigger systems. The other difference is about interference. In our model, interference requires the spaces to be neighboring sideways in time. Accepted physics does not have that concept. When I've put these differences to physicists, I was told that there is absolutely no way that the equations used are wrong because they've been experimentally tested for a hundred years now. And still, I'm suspicious. Have they really? Or has each lab mainly marveled at a bell state of two bits? Let's talk about the potential applications of quantum computing. The first is prime factorization. This has a particularly efficient quantum computing algorithm and is one of the types of problems that is ideally suited for quantum computing because the main effort boils down to trial and error. There are quantum computers with hundreds of qubits. So what's the largest number that has been factorized by a quantum computer? 21, not 21 bits, actually 21 equals three times seven on five qubits. This has recently beaten the long standing record of 15 equals three times five on four qubits. Quantum computers are demonstrably quite unstable and the industry has gone all in on error correction where you have massive redundancy, but maybe decoherence is not the whole problem. Before we move on to the second application, a few words to preempt objections. There is a special subtype of quantum computer that does quantum annealing, which is already useful. This works better with the concepts of multiple time dimensions, but it is not what's called a universal quantum computer and only useful for certain problems. Also. If you see reports that huge numbers have been factorized by quantum computer, check how much pre and post processing on classical computers is required and specifically how many qubits were used. AI application. Currently AI applications on neural networks are separated into two distinct phases. A learning phase called training and a phase where the acquired knowledge is applied, which is called inference. Training is very costly in processing power and a natural application for quantum computing. A large neural network training can take a month or more on thousands of specialized GPUs in parallel and can cost several million dollars to run. Contrast this to a human brain that runs with a power consumption of 20 watts. So part of this discrepancy is the digital implementation, simulating an analog noise tolerant process in a nearly perfectly accurate technology. There are also probably improvements that we can make to our training algorithms. But here's a wild idea for another reason for our brain's efficiency. Let's start with this question. How can we use quantum computing on a human brain to optimize our neural network and learn super efficiently? 
Do we need to stick the brain into a cryogenic container? The cryogenics in a quantum computer is only to stop information leaking out that through path selection affects the consciousness of the observer. But the brain is the home of consciousness and so is under our control. So to use quantum computing to optimize the neural network structure of our observer's brain, we'd have to turn off consciousness and also disconnect all sensory input and most outputs to actuators. You see where this is going. As an aside at this stage, I would like to point out something odd about animals. Evolution in animals seems to have tried a wild variety of strategies. There are flying mice and subaqua birds and creatures that move by bouncing around. But every animal sleeps. Why is there not at least one creature that has opted to be 24 hour active? You would have thought that there are at least some advantages to this. We humans can live longer and more easily without food than without sleep. Why is that? Before you get wild ideas about your dreams being memories of the adventures of your alter ego in the spider-verse next door, no. What I'm suggesting is that from the point you fall asleep, or more likely only when you enter a special sleep phase, your mind state spreads out much more than usual across your copies sideways in time. I'm not the only person to have such thoughts. Roger Penrose wrote a book called The Emperor's New Mind, where he argued that quantum processes are involved in consciousness and that AI on non-quantum conventional computers is doomed to be unsuccessful. When I read it in the 90s, I didn't understand Penrose's argument because I thought that any conventional computer could just simulate the quantum processes, but did not consider the raw performance required. This video was even more speculative than usual, but I hope you found it interesting and agree that it's pretty cool to think that how the same mechanism might be behind major problems in two seemingly unconnected fields. In my view, this is worth revisiting in a future video. Thanks for your attention.